It's Wednesday, it's TV Podcast Industries, and that's The Boys. This time, Season 1, Episode 6, The Innocents. Um, well, we lost my dad at a young age, and my mom, she worked two jobs. So it was uh, my older brother, Nathan, who, who pretty much raised me up. And when I was three, it's like these guys started shooting in front of my building, and I outran the damn bullet. <laughs> that's kind of how I figured out. Can I, can I stop you right there for a second? What if we ixnay the gun violence, maybe make it a click more upbeat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Welcome back to our coverage of The Boys. We're on Season 1, Episode 6, The Innocence. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hi, boys and girls. This is one of your other hosts, John. And rounding out this fantabulous trio, I'm Chris. We are so close to the end of this series. This is our third last episode. We're going into our penultimate episode next time, our finale after that, and then we have to wait about another nine months before we get to Season 2, but at least we know Season 2 is coming. Crossing fingers, all being filmed at the moment, so at least we know it's coming. That's kind of cool, right? Yeah, definitely. I'm both happy and sad at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm halad? No. Had? I'm had. There we go. (laughs) You've been had, Chris. I like it. I like it. Yeah, no, it's great stuff that uh, we already know there's going to be a season two. Yeah, it's just a shame. It's probably going to be next June by the time it gets released or something. Who knows, though? Could surprise us with an early Christmas present, or dare I say Easter present, or dare I say a Valentine's ode or something. (laughs) Maybe. Or let's hope that Amazon learn their lesson and release one episode a week of this show next time it comes back early next year and we have one episode a week for eight weeks that'd be awesome i'd love that <laughs> yes yeah. dumping is not a good idea and it doesn't work no dumping doesn't work we've, we've we learned don't that. like dumping <laughs> but if you want to join us for the boys season two and for the rest of this season make sure you subscribe to the podcast at tvpodcastindustries.com you can also find us on any soup or non-soup podcast player look for the boys tv or the boys tv podcast you'll find us over there just the specific podcasts about the boys or you can find us under tv podcast industries yes and of course we do mean superheroes not your favorite chicken broth. <laughs> I just mean soup, because they're not like, actually heroes in this show. So it's just a nice crusty roll. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That can go to superhero as well. Uh, if you want to send in any thoughts about the show, make sure you email us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. You can tell us what you think about the podcast or about the show, The Boys, of course. Um, or you can tell us anything about individual episodes of the show as well. And of course, a quick reminder about our Facebook group, we are on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries for all things to do with TV and podcasting about it. Mm-hmm. Well, particularly the shows that we're covering as well. Yes. <laughs> we don't just talk about the technical aspects of podcasting because exactly. that would be really boring. <laughs> There's the boys. There is Pennyworth as well. Mm-hmm. The, uh, pre Batverse uh, look into Alfred Pennyworth. Of course, we have Good Omens from earlier this year, as well as our Marvel Netflix shebang with Jessica Jones uh, Season 3. Mm-hmm. Yeah, loads and loads of stuff over there. And lots of more things on the horizon. Watch this space. Mm-hmm. But with all those details about our podcasting, back catalogue and forward catalogue, I think it's about time we dive into this episode with Derek. Do you want to give us the episode details. Yes, the episode was written by Rebecca Sonnenshine. Rebecca co-wrote the finale for the season as well, so we'll see her back later on in the season. Um, she also wrote the past couple of episodes of Outcast, along with 15 episodes of The Vampire Diaries. Remove wow. shirt. Left of, left of screen, I think, was most of the stage directions <laughs> on that show, if I remember correctly. Slightly different show over here. Show abs front and centre. <laughs> exactly. I didn't see a lot of Vampire Diaries. That might have just been the first couple of episodes of season one. Yeah. And I think season it's a three, wish list. four, five, eight, twelve, <laughs> episodes one to twelve. Basically, most of Vampire Di- It was... It was sexy charged Twilight, but it was... It had an audience, and it was it was well-written, so... I, I thought Fifty Shades of Grey was sexually charged Twilight. <laughs> Wasn't that what that was based on? <laughs> uh, we need to sit down and talk to you about that. 
What well, was the writing the main focus of that show? <laughs> anyway, Rebecca had absolutely nothing to do with that. Great to have her on board for this episode of the show. Lots of interesting stuff happening in this episode and took uh, a lot of pulling together of loads of different strands of this of this episode. Uh, great to see that she's coming back for the finale as well. The episode was directed by Jennifer Fang. Jennifer has been doing loads of work over the last couple of years. The last two years specifically, she's directed episodes of The Expanse, episodes of Cloak and Dagger. She did Ooh. the episode 11 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the, uh, the sixth season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D shield um and she's not done with superheroes she's going to be coming back to the ant- anticipated upcoming dc universe show star girl with episode 11 of that season currently filming at the moment so i think that's going to be out um later on this year i think um star girl but well, that, uh yeah that's great stuff yeah i love cloak and dagger so always great to see someone uh who has been working on cloak and dagger coming into the sphere that we uh, podcasts around and of course the expanse as well yeah. i love that show absolutely and i'll still say six seasons in agents of show they're still my favorite show that we're not podcasting about <laughs> absolutely love it and i'm very interested in the upcoming star girl i have to say mm-hmm. Starman was a big thing for me different character um but uh definitely interested to see what's done with this Excellent. yeah i love david bowie <laughs> very even more different John. <laughs> but john do you want to tell us what the game is with your synopsis for the episode in your best movie guy voice sure super in america brought to you by vort studios part of the vort cinematic universe as homelander battles with memories of his childhood queen Maeve battles with the truth of flight 37 and her long lost love eleanor Consumed with regret, Adrian must put his past with Poplaw behind him so he can deliver a future to those less fortunate. And a green crusader, the Deep, is up to his waist in rubbish. In a time of corporate dominance and greed, only one superhero, Starlight, must fight for what she believes is true. As her newfound crush, Huey Campbell, must prove she is trustworthy to his new boss, Billy Butcher still reeling from his loss of his wife, Becca. In a world where the ragtag band The Boys must prove the corruption of the Seven and Vought International, they gamble everything on Mesmer, a former soup fallen on bad times. In their moments of triumph, all is potentially lost as they realize they are protecting a super terrorist and Mesmer betrays them all fantastic john the only way you couldn't tell that you weren't american voiceover guy is because you said that uh that the deep was surrounded up to his waist in rubbish <laughs> for uh, american trash. listeners that's not garbage or trash yeah. yes <laughs> i should have said garbage why i should have known uh, it's ruined now the, the 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 mystical sort of mirage has been ruined it's like <laughs> Behind Princess Leia, I'm fat Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> no, it's nothing like that at all. Waki hula, <laughs> Ongi wongi, hunky hinky. <laughs> <laughs> Solo. Anyway, let's kick on into the episode. We've got three of our big points for the episode. We have, have our protagonist moment, our boys moment. We have the antagonist moment, the seven moment, and any other outstanding moments that we want to talk about. The one that's not, that kind of can be anything at all, uh, from I liked that guy's outfit to... Uh, probably the main theme of the episode most of the time uh chris do you want to kick us off with your boys protagonist moment sure uh for me this really is the collateral damage support group mm-hmm. or your superhuman uh support group um first of all we get reintroduced to our writer who we met earlier in the season um who was uh one of the writers uh i think he he was seth or he was eric he was one of them Seth from marketing, yes. Yes, yeah, Seth yeah. from marketing. And we hear about his quite unfortunate uh, incident mm-hmm. um, with uh, one of the, I think it was Ice Queen. That's right. Yep. Uh, um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, as I was watching it, I was slowly cringing as the story <laughs> get continues. I think every male viewer <laughs> and including, I think most people just went, oh, yeah. oh. Every single person in the room. I, I love that the story actually finishes with him going, and I just assume that that's the price you pay for being with a superhero like that, a goddess like that. You know, I yes. still want to be with her. And you're going, oh, no, uh-oh, that's not <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, I suspect Seth has some really sort of 
painful memories uh, and scary moments uh, when he goes to the ice cream cabinet mm-hmm. in his local Seven uh, <laughs> Eleven. Um, I do want to point out we get a name check for Tech Knight, mm, which yes. is a, another superhero in this universe, which is kind of an Iron Man, Batman, tech billionaire uh, kind of amalgam. Very good. Um, very nice. Very cool. Probably, hopefully, I don't think we'll meet him, but mm-hmm. definitely got a name check there yeah. about how he had uh, basically caused the spinal fracture of one of the ladies uh, in the support group. Uh, Lydia, I have. Lydia, yes. Oh, Lydia there in you the support go. Group, yes. Derek with my notes there. Cha-ching. Um, but <laughs> I good, really, huh? I, I really found this a really nice scene. Again, this is why I like the boys, right? Mm-hmm. Which is, it's showing the side of DC and Marvel cinematic universe, we don't get. Like, you're yeah. basically, there are so many people that are, like, that have been injured or probably, mm-hmm. like, destroyed by a soup saving them, and they need this type of support group. Yeah. But what's funny is, as you said, like, Seth is still enamored mm-hmm. by the Ice Queen. Uh, as you yeah. said, the price of being with a goddess. And you can see it in... The, the, the explosion that comes from Butcher. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is a very interest, interesting explosion. And I don't mean that in terms of kind of what triggers him, but it's just like he was so close, so close to the edge. Yeah. Um, about, I, I thought he was going to probably break some of his own tenants and start talking more about his wife there talking about Becca and the loss. Now that comes later and we can, we'll, yeah. we'll probably, we'll touch on that in our own points later. But really this is so interesting to see that he, he doesn't, there, there's that whole, let's talk about it. Let's work through it together mm-hmm. kind of mentality. And then there's butchers, which is they need to pay. Yes. And yeah. he was hoping that by bringing Huey to this group, he would be reminded of the pain and suffering soups are causing. Yeah. But action in actuality, it's potentially showing Huey that yes, there is that, there is still that bad side, but Starlight's not that person. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think what I saw with Butcher here is that he's looking at these people with disdain. He's looking at these people going, why are you still accepting it? Look what they've done to your yeah. lives. Look what they've destroyed in your lives. And you're just sitting there giving them all excuses saying, Oh, but weren't they great for saving me? I just wish he was a bit more protective of my spine, but <laughs> stand up and punch and fight and beat back against these people because they can't be allowed to get away from it. There's only seven of them and there's millions of us humans effectively. And that's, that's Butcher's point. He's not a victim. He's not going to go to a support group for a victim. And I think that's, you know, we'll talk about it, but I think that is the reason why he shares with Huey his story is because he does see himself as being in a support group with Huey almost. He's saying the two of us have this experience and we can share what happened to us with each other because we know we can deal with it. We're not going to sit in a room with all these other people and go, this is what happened to me, but we'll let them away with it. We just have to deal with it because we live in a world with superheroes now. Um, I think that's that's really, really good style for this show. Really, really good writing on that. I think you've said it all, actually, Chris. It, you know, first of all, ACDS, um, the actual group, the Association of Collateral Damage Survivors, I really, really like. And then you have this uh, Billy outburst. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, what's it, it summed up for me is, where's the rage? He just sees them as a bunch of scared rabbits. Yeah. But the other side of that is... You know, these are people who have, you know, it's to reflect onto Huey, as you said, Chris, that, you know, here are people who have been absolutely either damaged physically themselves or emotionally damaged. And they're sat around still effectively thinking these superheroes, uh, well, that's just who, who they are. They've got these superpowers. She couldn't help it that she suddenly went, you know, uh, negative 346 degrees. Um, and, you know, basically my midriff is in the way of that. Mm-hmm. So for, for poor Seth, and it, it, it's that thing of trying to just reflect that back to Hugh to say, don't start making excuses for them because, you know, Billy has this, um, suspicion, uh, that Huey and Starlight are probably getting closer than, Billy is expecting, you know, for him, he sent Huey on a mission 
to tap her phone, follow her, mm-hmm. you know, get the intel from her as well, not to start sort of forgetting Robin and going on a date because yeah. he hasn't been able to do that with Becca. And I think the one thing I suppose that, that he's really, he's absolutely right about here as well is, you know, even though someone may be an absolute mastery of their superhuman powers, accidents can happen. And why are you putting yourself in the way if Starlight blinds you with her hands because by mistake they go off while you're in the way and haven't closed your eyes as she's told people to do in the past? Is Huey going to be blinded by her because he's, he's staying too close to her kind of thing? You know, stick, stick away from her. Her and her kind are what ha- caused what happened to you is kind of the way that, that Billy Butcher's talking, you know? Um, I really, I really do like the scene. I must say, I think it's, I think it's really well observed and really, uh, and really interesting to watch how these characters are interacting with each other. It did give me some slight reminders of Kilgrave support group back from Jessica Jones season one, uh, where Jessica had the same kind of situation, all these people kind of going. And then he told me to give me my coat. And oh my God, I feel like he was inside my mind telling me to do things. And Jessica kind of looking at them going, you have no idea what a person who can control your mind actually could do to you. And you're giving out about this, you know, it felt like that kind of similar style uh, of support group, but just kind of like the idea of somebody else seeing these people trying to support each other from the outside. It was quite cool. Yeah, definitely. John, do you want to take us off from there? Yeah, mine is the feral pixie dream girl is a terrorist. <laughs> but not any old terrorist. She is a super terrorist. Mm-hmm. And she has a name as well, Kimiko. Uh, so I really like that we got a little bit of the backstory here uh, being sort of delivered via Mesmer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a real neat way for Mother's Milk and um, for, for Frenchie to get what they need from the female to find out more about her. Yeah. Uh, you know, one from an Intel point of view for Mother's Milk and Frenchie, maybe a little bit more of a personal thing because he is effectively speaking to her and she's not giving any responses. Is that great? Or, you know, she's, she's not replying back to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's that great moment where she kind of looks at him and he gets very excited that, you know, she does understand me. She yeah. is listening to me. Um, so she's I thought, communicated that she wants to watch Shark, Shark yeah, Week, exactly. basically. <laughs> like, <woo-hoo. laughs> um, so I thought this was really nice, you know, in the, well, not necessarily a backstory, but that the, um, you know, we kind of get this revealed through this, um, connection between Mesmer and the female. Of course, I think Mesmer probably, uh, gets off a little worse than her by having his arm snapped, mm-hmm. uh, which looked pretty painful. But, you know, there's this backstory here of her effectively being kidnapped as a child, brought up in this terrorist organization. These symbols are actually what she remembers on the night of being kidnapped, the, the palm trees silhouetted against the moon. Yeah. Um, and then I suppose the interesting question following on from this is, well, and how does she get into the hands of Vault International or is it the triads or the accuser or, or something like that that is keeping her but they've captured her uh during her terrorist activities the and ones that were dosing her up on yeah, v, yeah. and of yeah. course vort in a sense can't have anything to do with her um in a direct sense so mm-hmm. it these people are effectively feeding her with compound v yeah. to turn her into this super terrorist because what's the only way to fight a super terrorist boys it's a superhero. A superhero. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and so this is probably feeding into, to Vought International's, um, sort of drive and push to get onto the, uh, Defense Department's payroll effectively. Yeah. I really uh, like with that. With their superhero. So there's that moment where it says, um, you know, there is no rock bottom for this company. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, I, I like that phrase. You know, Vought cannot go rock bottom because they don't have one. Yeah, Any, exactly. Anything, is on the table yeah. for something that will advance them. So I, I think uh, e- even just the fact that she was pr- in prison, you know, it just uh, it, it's it's a nice moment to get some uh, flesh on the bones of the the feral pixie dream girl. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, great, really interesting to see that backstory, and really interesting to see this idea of that character. And um, I, I really liked that reveal actually because I didn't put two and two together until it was revealed by Frenchie that she was going to be released into the world taken down by a superhero and perhaps they could have hundreds of people just like her all across the country all being fed with compound v to be bad guys versus the compound v fed soups i think that's a really cool idea that 
she's just one of of possibly hundreds uh, out there to uh, to be taken down by the soups or maybe there's just six more and there's the seven evil versus seven good possibly you know maybe that was it i i, I just love that they're making super villains mm-hmm. super terrorists i i love that reveal because it's an it's something it's something unique to the series Mm-hmm. Um, out of the comic books and things like that. So I will, I'll, I'll put that now, which is, this is diverging from the comic books. There's still the essence there, but it's diverging mm-hmm. in a good way. But it's that, it's that, that potential, which is there haven't been super villains to date. Right. That we've been, that we're made aware of. So there is no mm-hmm. like Ocean Master or Doctor Doom or anything like that. Yeah. So they, in order to, amp it up they're creating the bad guys yeah, yeah and so it's just so interesting it's it was just it wasn't where i was expecting as we slowly get her backstory as they slowly kind of reveal it through those me- those mesmer scenes it was just i was like oh i was like oh you're zigging oh no no you're zagging oh no no you're zigging again oh that's where you're going so it was mm. just I couldn't, uh, it was just fantastic writing in my opinion. Just the, the way that they, they piecemealed the parts of it out. Yeah. And what did you think, Chris? Cause I know we were talking about it back in episode, or episode three podcast or episode four podcast. You were saying that the, that the female has never had her name revealed in the book at all. And you were saying that that's part of the thing you love about the character is having none of her backstory. And now we have the backstory revealed on the show or, or a, a part of it, I suppose. How do you think they've, they've handled that by having to reveal a little bit of her backstory? Does it still okay for, for your version of the character or? So I'm going to get into this in Chris's corner. Okay. Uh, more. This is a complete divergence from the comic books. Mm-hmm. It's made for this series. Mm-hmm. Now I'm okay with it because yeah. it, it's like the Batman films, right? There's different takes on the Batman. Mm-hmm. They're still at essence. There's still the core tenants there, but Ben Affleck versus George Clooney versus uh, Christian Bale. They're yeah. all different. Michael Keaton. They're all mm-hmm. slightly different takes with the core themes there. Yeah. So as long as they continue that core theme bit, I, I'm okay with it. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely different and. Watch this space. We'll get into it in Chris's corner later. Excellent. Yeah, and I think they didn't really reveal a huge amount about her backstory, just enough to kind of give you a taster of the fact that the guy, the boys can trust this character. She was taken away from her home. She, all she wants to do is get back to her, her brother and help him out, help him out of this group. I really like that little moment with Frenchie towards the end where he's saying, if you want to go right now, I'll put you on a plane. I'll even go with you if you want me to. And she says no and holds on to him. Actually, she says, she says nothing, she says no words, but she holds on to him and they don't leave. So she's now saying, I'm willing to stay with you guys until you solve what you need to do. And then I'll go back to my brother kind of thing. I love that they've played that little silent moment between the two of them. And that was cool. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, definitely. It was good just to get some flesh on her bones uh, around, you know, the the context of of the female. Uh, but Derek, what are your boys' moments? Kind of tied in similarly with the support group and similarly with getting more information about the characters. Really, um, my my moment really is about Rainer rejecting the offer. Kind of. Um, I think it's really important to talk about uh, Billy Butcher and the story of what actually happened to his wife. You know, we we've talked about it a few times, wondering what it is. That took uh, his wife back away. We find out here when he finally reveals to um, to Huey that his wife was raped by Homelander. She then spent three hours sitting on this bench in a park, staring off into space, space, and he has the video footage of that. That's the video footage he's been watching is her just sitting, staring off into space, not knowing what to do. She walked off out of sight of that camera and never came back again. And that has led Butcher on his mission to take down Homelander. And any soups involved, any other soup that could possibly do this to anybody else effectively. So I really like this final reveal, I suppose, of what's going on with Billy Butcher. And I like that when he takes this whole thing to Rainer, everything they've learned, all the information that they've learned, he, he has, you know, the, the list of demands is quite hilarious. I love it. You know, oh, you're looking for an extortion amount of money and an office and equipment for all of your gang. Yeah, I can do all that stuff, but I can't give you Homelander. And he takes everything and walks out the door, tells everybody that Rainer wouldn't go for it at all because she didn't want to tangle with Voight. She never said that she actually would have been willing to tangle with Voight International, but she can't guarantee that they'll take down Homelander. Therefore, Billy Butcher is actually the one that says, no, I'm out. 
I think that was a really interesting scene. As you said, the true thread reveal that leads to Rainer's rejection is amazing. I, I want to call out one quick Easter egg. The building she suggests mm-hmm. is the building that they have in the comic books. It's that iconic building in New York on the corner with the, it looks like a V. It's in Friends. It's in Seinfeld. It's oh, yeah. in Will and Grace. Um, it, it's oh, yeah, a yeah. well known building. That? Yeah, I think it's the Flatiron Building. Yes. Yeah, Fifth Avenue on one side yeah, in New York. Yeah, I've walked down that street many times. It's a really cool building. So that that's where the boys are based in in New York in the comic books, or is that just she's just yeah, that's, suggesting that's they should the be building. in the in the show? Oh, that that right. they have their <laughs> office up the top, and they regularly go up to the 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 roof of that building and so Excellent. on. Excellent. I think the other thing as well the um the scene where uh, Billy and Huey are sat on the park bench mm. and Billy is telling his story of Becca and, and the incident with Homelander to, to Huey. That park as well, uh, speaking of iconic um, sort of views, buildings and that of New York, I'd love to know what park that is because there's a, the view from there towards mm-hmm. kind of, um, I, I think it's the Chrysler building or the Empire State building, but also the Freedom Towers. Right. Um and I've never seen it from that view before. Mm. Um, it was completely new to me. Um, completely new kind of view of, of New York. I mean, unless it's from Central Park, but I don't think they were in Central I don't Park. Think so yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really interesting. Yeah. And considering, um, I think I always find it really interesting considering we've done, you know, the five, uh, Marvel Netflix shows all filmed in New York. We've done Gotham, which was filmed in New York as well. And we've seen loads of different places from different angles and having a brand new angle on New York is always really interesting. You notice it really quickly when you've done, you know, five years of podcasting almost exclusively about shows filmed in New York. You notice these brand new places that, uh, that people are able to find. It's quite a cool, cool little spot. Yeah. I'd love to see it. Uh, one other thing about Rainer rejecting the offer. I completely agree with why. I <laughs> just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I, I say that. Renner is absolutely right to not give up Homelander to Billy Butcher because exactly what she says is, if I try and give him up to you, we're not powerful enough to stop him and you could be costing thousands of lives here. He literally just has to open his eyes and he can kill thousands of people around him in seconds and we don't have any kind of power to stop him. So they need to work out a way to stop him or take down his power or maybe get get Queen Maeve on board to take off his head. Because right now, there's nothing, just because they have the information doesn't mean Homelander is going to stop doing what he's doing. Um, so I think she was probably right at the moment to say, I can't do that. But it was a really good moment. Yeah, it's just interesting to see where this goes. Because mm-hmm. now that they have rejected, or Butcher rejected the offer, what's next? And he's mm-hmm. lied to the boys. Um, yeah. So yeah. what will happen if M.M. reaches out to Rainer? Does yeah. he have that connection? Uh, do any of the other boys have the, does Rainer have connection with any of the other boys? Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes from this. Yeah. I just, I wonder, yeah, you're right. You know, all these guys thinking maybe I could have, that could have been our way out. We could have been able to go back to our normal lives that Billy dragged us away from if he just accepted that offer, but he's not willing to do it because of his own personal vendetta, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, let's get on to our antagonist moment since we've been talking about Homelander. Chris, do you want to give us your antagonist moment for the episode? A yes. Seven moment. So my seven moment, my antagonist moment is actually the antagonist is Compound V Mm. because we get this beautiful debrief um, where Mother's Milk has spent so much time prepping all the files and (laughs) doing his research. um, And we get the the kind of backstory of how they're building the soups Mm -hmm. that it's not just one or two hospitals. There's we get a map of the Americas. And pins in multiple states, multiple cities, multiple hospitals. It's not just Ezekiel's foundation that's doing it. It's mm-hmm. other foundations. This has been going on for years, up to 1971, where they've been basically injecting kids with Compound V, mm-hmm. building soups after soups after soups. Um, so it's so interesting to see that, that, that how they're doing this. Yeah. Um, now, in the comic books, Compound V, it's quite similar, but it's not just an injection. It mm-hmm. can be, uh, so people who are exposed to Compound V in different ways through touch skin, um, secondary things can yep. develop it as well. So it, they're, 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 they're playing a bit loose with Compound V in that mm-hmm. it's injections only, but 
we'll, we'll have to see if they, they they'll kind of expand out on that. Um, yeah. The one thing I, I'm finding really interesting is, uh, is that the female was not a child or a baby when mm-hmm. she was taken, and to our knowledge, she was not a soup before. Yeah. So does that mean that if the boys are injected with compound V, they too will grant be granted some form of superheroes powers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really interesting, isn't it? And, you know, it's one of those ones where it's so random as well. You don't know whether since they've been injecting kids since the seventies all over the country, you know, that's potentially thousands and thousands of children. Have every single one of them got superpowers? Have the tests not worked on some people? That is, is it like not to bring it back to Marvel again, but is it like the Terrigen Mists and the Inhumans that it it brings out an innate ability that's within some people and not in others? So you test it on as many as possible to get a small base, you know, it, it, you're, you're wondering about that. There's some yeah. other elements within this episode where you find that a lot of these kids that were, uh, that were experimented on don't have parents or don't have a past. So are the kids all created in test tubes using compound V at the beginning, at their inception effectively, so that they're not just being injected. They're also being formed from compound V almost. Yeah. But as you say, female does seem to be the, unique example of this but we haven't got all of her backstory we only got a couple of flashes of her backstory so she could have been another child created with compound v as well so there's really interesting stuff in this episode definitely yeah i i think so yeah it it, it, it what i find most interesting is as you said it's that where they're going with it they're making compound v we uh, it looked like at the beginning it was going to be like steroids for soups mm-hmm. but actually it's going beyond that it's they are taking it as it creates soups so yeah yeah it's fundamental it's what those variations are really so yeah. like what it's going to be and i i'm hoping upon hope we see the boys souped up <laughs> maybe uh, maybe it, it's going to be definitely an interesting thing seeing butcher go toe to toe with homelander is going to be amazing you well, see yeah. that's the one i would question i would think maybe any of the other boys would take compound v but Butcher's distrust of soups has already extended to Starlight because she's one of the seven. And already he's talked about, I don't care about what happens to the female. I don't care if she's helping us. I don't care about her at all. Yeah. She's super powered. I want her dead and I want her out of the room, basically, is, is kind of the way he's talked about her. So I'm not too sure whether he would inject himself. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder, like, I kind of hope that they don't take mm-hmm. Compound V from my side. But I wonder if that is the only way that they can take down Homelander. Maybe. Um, unless we have something of a secret lab uh, with the CIA that Reina hasn't told us of where they're developing stuff. We've still got the Mallory files mm-hmm. where it seemed to suggest that the security agencies realize that they could be a threat and that if yeah. they go AWOL, um, then, you know, they need to be taken down. As Billy said, if Ice Queen can uh, do what she did to, to Paul Seth in, you know, the height of her pleasure... Mm-hmm. What happens if they're as angry as anything? And Homelander is an angry, angry man, mm-hmm. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I also liked on this, uh, just the little sort of frustration that Mother's Milk is there. He's like, you know, I'm trying to do a TED talk here, <laughs> uh, because he keeps getting interrupted by Frenchie, or I think it's the, the feral pixie dream girl is sort of nicking some of his files that he's this dossier that he's compiled yeah. all on Compound V. Um, so yeah, he's, uh, he's a dossier maker, man after my own heart. <laughs> Chris's quarter came to life in this episode as we got that whole speech from Frenchie to, uh, Mother's Milk as to why he would have to be a person that would care that she doesn't fit in the world, that the female doesn't fit in the world without her story, where he's kind of going, you know, you can't leave a highlighter misaligned on the table because you have to have that sort of, you can't eat chunky chunky monkey ice cream because if you if you eat the top of it and the top of the ice cream becomes out of level you have to eat the whole box of of ice cream basically you know so uh, it just shows exactly what you were talking about this is a character who has to have everything in its right place you know so yeah uh, so that's probably a really good explanation of how butcher was able to get him on board in the first place which was present him with some idea of something in the universe that isn't going the way it should be going and he has to go after it he, ha- he has that tenacity that he has to get it fixed he has that add about him that he has to yeah. get it fixed so that's quite cool yeah it's the the, the soups are the the uh, the in order the, the chaos within the universe yeah. 
They must be fixed. Yeah. But he speaking of things that must be fixed, uh, John, do you want to give us your antagonist moment? Oh, yes. My seven moment is Homelander in his role as Super in America. Um, like, I'm a massive fan of this character uh, and the actor that plays uh, Homelander. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I really thought this was, was great because, not that I felt sympathy for him, but... Um, I, I like the fact that we saw this happy childhood memory, which was effectively one big fake. Uh, and I think he, he calls it out to Madeline Silwell. What would you do? How did you grow up? What would you do if you were taken around to places where you had never been to a home you'd never lived in mm-hmm. and seeing all these paraphernalia that you'd never owned or read or whatever. Yeah. Um, and parents that you've never met. And Photographs pa- of parents yeah, that you've never met. That yeah. you've never met. So, you know, part of it was that, you know, this is all absolutely just um, a story for, for Vought International and for the image of Homelander, but it's one that actually does um, affect him because, in a sense, this childhood is all made up. Um, mm-hmm. he, he's never had that. Um, and we see this less happy to an extent. But I say that, I say less happy childhood, but actually it's the moment where he's laughing and clutching at his blanket, which mm-hmm. he goes mental over um, in the fake surroundings. And I think it's because that is the one real thing that he can remember and it's surrounded in all this other fakeness. And I really like that, um, that... You know, the flashback of him sat in on that cold floor in the lab is the one time you see Homelander clutching onto his blanket, smiling because one of the scientists, or John Doman, is there sort of pulling silly faces through the door and he's chuckling and laughing at mm-hmm. the scientist being... And I, I just thought that was really good. And then, of course, it comes to your point on Compound V. Have this history of Compound V... But is Homelander patient zero, effectively? Mm. That he doesn't have... Well, he has parents, but maybe he was taken really, really early yeah. and then has been institutionalized in Vought Labs, Vought International, Vought Corporate, uh, totally institutionalized yeah. uh, to be the defender of Vought. And that's why he's... Even though he says... You know, people are like ants. Why do we listen to these people? I can write better stuff than that. He's still, and this is what Madeline also, um, is very much, I think, acutely aware of. He is absolutely loyal to the evil mega brand that is Vought International. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to, to increase its profits and all this kind of stuff. So I really enjoyed this jarring, uh, difference between Homelander, happy, childhood and homelander less happy childhood uh being effectively um centered around this blanket where i think unfortunately and set deck uh was terminated i i love that nobody knows his actual surname it's (laughs) set decorator anthony and they call him just ant set deck (laughs) (laughs) hyphenated set deck as well and presumably someone got the the baseball through their head or something mm-hmm. like that that's going to call a lot of damage on that. <laughs> um, i do have two quick questions about that there, there's that interesting moment where he goes and sees the blanket packed back up in its wrapping saying homelander's blanket do not use i'm wondering whether somebody used it knowingly that they shouldn't they shouldn't have used it and used it to wind homelander up basically so has somebody is somebody trying to um to affect him so did madeline use it possibly to piss him off after what happened in the last episode um because it seems like he's told people many many times not to use that so it's somewhere around it's somewhere close to the set don't know why it's even there but why was it used is it because of that did they just blame this guy at set deck or did somebody else uh, get involved? Um, just wondering about that. The other one as well, when you say uh, Homelander patient, is, is he patient zero? Really interestingly, is he just the first person that Compound V worked on and that's been the template they've used for everybody else? Because look at how powerful he is in comparison to everybody else. He's yeah. effectively what he's... He can fly, he's got x-ray vision, he can blow lasers out of his eyes, he's basically got super super speed when he flies, you know. Um, nobody else seems to have that level of power. Everybody else seems to have a specific power like Queen Maeve is, is super strength. A-Train's 
uh, fast runner. You know, nobody else seems to have the same level of powers that he has. So if he's the first one and everybody else is just lower than him or worse than him, did they do something different with him? So that's going to be really interesting to see as well. So uh, yeah, really good, really good point. Yeah, a really interesting, uh, every element of this. I'll, I'll call out two quick points on this. One is, um, Stillwell's control, where you talk about the blanket. Did someone do that? Stillwell mm-hmm. uses even more perverse techniques mm-hmm. to control him to get him back on track. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in the last episode, we talked about the, the quite strange the moment they had, but then seeing this moment where she does it, it before it was pseudo weird sexual this is just full on sexual it's not a mother and son it's a lover embrace um so it's weird to see that mm-hmm. um but again it's that control the the puppet master controlling her puppets uh or puppet in this case yeah and then secondly the 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 point where we see homelander in the lab with the doctor um staring at him with his blanket um uh, but then on the wall they had a target with all the different burn marks across it so obviously homelander learning his vision playing peekaboo that it's so interesting to see i'll call out x-ray again amazon x-rays for this scene because what they do they actually had a deleted scene from this episode all right which extends further into homelander's um lab time when he was there which is him a bit older with a a teacher mother figure i suggest everyone go watch it it's really interesting to leave the scene uh it just played uh late it it must have been cut from a later part of this episode all right interesting i did not see that i have to see that because it didn't didn't pop up on our screen when we were watching the uh, the episode uh really good yeah there's there's some so such cool stuff about homeland in this episode yeah Um, most of this stuff is coming from effectively from the revelation of the movie that's being made to try and uh, sell all of these characters to uh, to the army effectively that's what's going on with homelander uh, i love just a little bits of this as i'll pick up on my own point next in a second but i love how they deal with queen mave effectively they they show the scene with her outside being all superhero and then they cut to another camera angle of it and it's actually just somebody throwing some water in the air to make it look like it's raining <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah you've got a real superhero moment but the the documentary filmmaker seems to have something weird going on with her um where she wants to film all the actual background stuff that's going on when Maeve talks to uh, her ex-girlfriend elena uh, it's being filmed by this documentary yeah. film crew as well so you're wondering are they trying to get information on the seven as well stuff that they can manipulate them in future whether that's because vault wants it or whether it's because somebody else wants it i don't really know i'm just kind of intrigued by uh by what's going on with her and um, we see that bit with a train where he's telling his backstory which you would presume if he's telling his origin story it's the hundredth time he's told his origin story but when he's saying it that he realized he could outrun bullets and then is told to tone it down and take the bullets out of it going why would you do that oh you need to pg it up a little bit you know yeah. uh, it seems really weird the producers kind of add him for that uh, you know especially because they're trying to sell it to the armed forces wouldn't you want to say that this guy can outrun bullets but it is it's it's quite interesting uh, we also see that he's still having problems running as well uh when he's training with his brother he's not able to reach the kind of level of speed that he was able to reach in the past so I think that was quite interesting um he's obviously given up the drugs like he told homelander he would but that means he's not achieving the speed he was able to in the past so are these guys totally dependent on compound v uh, that they have to take it at regular intervals or else they start losing their powers completely so that's little touches in there yeah yeah no good point actually i actually thought that was to do with popclaw uh like he was still having to deal and process with with him killing her maybe maybe yeah yeah what's what's really interesting is that for every thread they close or reveal they they leave just enough of a hint to make you question more mm-hmm. exactly mm-hmm. exactly uh that's what's going to lead to a season two right so that's always good um, my actual antagonist moment for the episode my seven moment for the episode is actually about the deep i know i said i don't like this character and i keep bringing him up every episode because they're doing great things with him um, I, i'm glad he's dealing with his version of me too um Everybody knows what happened. Everybody knows it's him now. He has to reveal it on the news and is told that he's being sent away from the seven. Effectively, he's being sent away from New York to a new posting uh, to hide out while 
the ramifications of him forcing himself on Starlight are dealt with effectively. I love his first reaction to hearing this from Madeline is, oh, why don't you just do what you normally do and just deal with it? And she goes, this is us dealing with it. You just happen to be on the receiving end this time, not something being swept under the carpet, uh, which I just think is really good. Uh, I love his video, his version of the video where they have um, the the guys on the beach <laughs> all picking up rubbish all around them. And then the minute the video is finished, you hear uh, you hear the guys go extras put back down the rubbish on the beach. <laughs> That's hilarious. Nice little touch from Vought. Uh, it is pointed out in the X-rays curse as well. The uh, the idea that he's driving a Humvee since he's supposed to be pro- promoting um <laughs> This idea of a, of a society that's that's better for nature and better for the oceans, yet he's driving the most gas guzzling vehicle there is in America. Uh, nice little, <laughs> little nice little touch there from the from the creator of the show. But the best part of this whole thing is them showing the out, out the outtakes version of his Me Too apology, and not really showing his actual apology. We see a little bit of it, a little cut of it later on. But I love that you see the outtakes version of it because the outtakes version of it sounds like probably a lot of those videos that we've seen over the last two years of people apologizing for things they didn't really mean to do uh, over the years. So I really like that they decided to put it this way in the episode rather than putting it just as as a spot on the TV channel with him speaking live for three minutes apologizing. So this was actually actually an edited version of it. So, um, So I thought that was really good. Some great moments in there. 100%. 100%. It's really interesting to see how they, they, they framed the wording around, we mm-hmm. thought this was consensual. It's, I'm sorry if she, if, if I misunderstood. It's, but again, as you said, showing the outtakes of that where he's like, no, that doesn't sound right. Or, Absolutely. No, no, no. Like, not him. When the people actually, behind the count, when the people behind the camera are going, no, no, you need to sell it more to him. Yeah. You know, it's all an act. You know, it's completely an act. He's not apologetic for anything. And I'm, again, I'm sure there are a few people over the course of the last few years who've said, Similar things in front of cameras have a mental word of them either. So uh, just showing how easily it is to to do. Exactly. Fantastic writing. Yeah. 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 Really, really good. I do wonder if this is the end of the deep. Is this the moment when we don't see the deep for the rest of the series because he's been sent out of the city now? Does he come back to replace somebody who may be leaving the seven again uh, later on this season? So, so yeah, really interesting. On to our other outstanding moments. Chris, what's your other moment of the episode that stood out to you that we haven't talked about yet. Huey and Starlight, Sitting Energy, K-I-S-S-O, wait, here comes some friends. <laughs> um, I, I really enjoyed these scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, particularly, it's the budding romance. I know we've talked about Butcher and Huey um, and the, that kind of the, the, the reveal and what that meant. I liked how we start to see, over the course of this episode, their relationship blossom more and more um to the point where we do get the kiss and after the kiss robin's ghost is gone so it it seems like huey is starting to move on Mm. and then we get the 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 butcher drop the nuclear explosion of his backstory with his wife and huey's able to separate that Huey is doing the the adult thing and going no but Starlight Annie is not like this and this could be different we get talk about the the pink sands why don't they go on a trip let's just do it um both of them wanting to escape but being dragged back in and then culminating in Butcher actually dropping by the table reminding him of the nuclear bomb he's going to drop on Annie yeah, yeah. Is it a threat? No. This is truth and fact with Butcher. He will do something, I think. I'm fully expecting it to happen in the next episode. Okay, so the the actual when she finds out is I'm about to tell her in uh, whatever way yes. I'm going to tell her. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, the way, that's the way I took it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because uh, Huey's response is, "What do you mean when?" Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I do. I love the original one of the other friend that turns up, Anthony, uh, who just turns up and basically just releases all of the stories about Huey and how awkward he was when he was when he was growing <laughs> up at school. I always think that's hilarious because that, it's happened to every single one of us when when one of our mates has turned up unexpected to meet our our partner for the first time. It's always funny. <laughs> it's, well, yeah, and it's it's like having gone off to university where you kind of. You're, you're creating your new life or something, mm-hmm. you're, or you're thrown off the shackles of secondary school and you're growing up effectively. And then all of a sudden, 
your new friends who know you like that are suddenly introduced to this whole other side to you. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> to some extent, you know what I mean? Absolutely, it's like, yeah. Um, I remember the time that guy couldn't hold his drink. Ha, ha, and that kind and of it's just too. heightened here with Huey because he's trying to be uber cool because mm-hmm. he's chatting and trying to hook up with this superhero. Yeah. Um, well, maybe. I, I'm still like, is it fully genuine or not? I know. But, um, cause there is that weird moment w- during that conversation with Anthony specifically where Huey's face drops and he walks away and Anthony meets him at the bar just afterwards and you kind of find out that the reason why he's walked away is because he's thinking about Robin and what Robin would think. Anthony tries to put his mind at ease, tells him, you know, I know you've gone missing for weeks, but I understand why this woman is completely out of your league. And if you need to do anything to keep this woman as your new girlfriend, do it. That's what Robin would have wanted. She would have wanted you to be happy. You can still see within Huey, he's kind of going, well, yeah, but she probably didn't think I'd move on in three weeks or a week or two weeks, whatever it's been since she's died. You know, she probably didn't would want me to be happy, but maybe not this quickly after she's gone. You know, but he um, still sees the ghost of Robin still, exactly uh, yeah. in the bar. So but then he goes in for the kiss. So that's the thing to me. It's like, is the kiss genuine? Because mm-hmm. or he's seen Robin like with the other episodes and then he's done something to further that involvement or you know tapping a phone or or doing something to further the cause of the boys and billy butcher yeah so yeah yeah, it's interesting yeah so i i do think that the the potentially there was uh there is something genuine only because he sees robin before the kiss and after they after they kiss robin's disappeared so i think it's him accepting Mm. that it's okay to move on okay yeah i hope i hope uh, but anyway, so that yeah. was kind of my outstanding moment. Uh, John, what is your outstanding moment? I suppose it's Mesmer. Ultimately, we get introduced to, uh, Mesmer. Yes. Although I, I still wanted to keep calling him Mesmerizer, but that's the name of the show. Uh, but we, we get Mesmer at the convention. I, I do like the fact that we have Billy Zane there, who we saw very briefly in Pop Claw's movie that mm-hmm. A Train was kind of reminiscing over. And, uh, yeah. and then there's also Tara Reed. So I do wonder if we'll get another kind of little cameo of her in some other movie or production that they've done with another superhero. And one of the other VCU yeah. movies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's great to see um, Seth Rogen in there as well as another, uh, another cameo for this episode where he's talking about the future Black Noir movie. Uh, Cause Black Noir still doesn't talk. So they had to have somebody in the scene with them. So why not get Seth Rogen down there saying he's directing the movie? That's quite Yeah, cool. that was really good. And even <laughs> in the, the, the super heroes in America, mm-hmm. he, well, he's making tea effectively, <laughs> isn't he? He's kind of, do, he's going through a, a tea ceremony. I think. Black Noir. Yeah. He's yeah, doing the tea so, ceremony. Um, yeah, he's not, not dealing with any of the humans. Yeah. But, but I like Mesmer here. Um, first of all, you know, he can see dead people um or at least he can communicate with people um she died in the last one came back to life so it's kind of like okay, okay. he's channeling the kid from six cents here mm-hmm. uh, but i like the fact that he's kind of you know using sort of mind powers to meld a bit sort of vulcan-esque like uh with um the female i like that i i think um and i i just like the fact that you know he is sold so you're you're watching him all the way through this episode as he absolutely hates Vought. Um, he is their Achilles heel. He was, you know, in some way disgraced or he left. Um, and that's why Frenchie and Mother's Milk really go and do this, which is something that Billy Butcher is absolutely opposed to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do like the fact that he does say um, to, to Mesmer when um, he comes to his kind of small home and goes... Nice decor, 80s serial killer. <laughs> um, I thought that was really good. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, Frenchie uh, and Mother's Milk, in going after Mesmer, the fact that they're basing him with his estranged daughter, who kind of really doesn't care. So uh, even that hug in, in the park that um, and that setup between his daughter mm. and Mesmer, that hug in the park, he's obviously feeling, you know, he knows and... and exactly what he 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 says he knows that she was only there because she was being told she had to be yeah not because she wanted to be um you oh. know so he realizes he's kind of lost her really yeah but um is he, he kind of cuts this tragic figure and you know the routine is because 
he hates Voight. You know, you're kind of there thinking, oh, is he a new ally for the boys? Is he um, a new addition to the boys, yeah. even to some extent? Um, and in the end, uh, he turns out to be an absolute backstabbing betrayer where effectively he gives the pictures of all the boys to Homelander mm-hmm. uh, from his uh, from his phone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it, it's a really good introduction, uh, and with a big play because, yeah, Homelander absolutely knows. Yeah, yeah, Homelander now knows exactly who all of the boys are, um, except for the female. So he doesn't doesn't have a photograph of her, which I think is quite interesting. He only hands over the four photographs that he's been asked for. Um, I know we did this on the Pennyworth podcast, John, so I'm sorry I might be channeling that a little bit, but it is leaving me with questions again in this episode, so I'm questioning once again. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Um, what I'm wondering, what my question for this character of Mesmer is, was it a bad idea to bring him to his daughter and allow him to touch her and read her? Because that's what he seems to do. And once he's read her, he realizes, it seems, that she doesn't know anything about him at all. So I wonder, is this the pain of being a super that has a child that they get the opposite of your powers? He's able to touch a person and feel exactly what is going through them, feel everything about them, know everything about them. Yet she doesn't know anything at all about her own father. Um, And I wonder if that was the big mistake that pushed him over the edge. He thought he was going to get to see his daughter every week and then realized she doesn't even know who he is. So he's able to just go, right, dump my life and maybe I'll be able to get an opportunity back working for Vought again. Um, yeah, because I mean, the, the way he's selling it to Homelander is very much, um, look, can you get me back in here? I'll do anything. I'll even take a pretty low wage to begin with. Yeah, we did calculate a low five-figure salary <laughs> is 10,000 quid. <laughs> 10,001 quid. So uh, that's a low five figure sal- salary, which would be a very low salary, wouldn't it? That's, that's lower than, than most service industry jobs. Yeah. <laughs> I think he might have meant six figure, but he probably got that wrong. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of like, yeah, that's how desperate he is. He'll yeah. take 10,000 a year. And one dollar, uh, effectively. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Homelander doesn't like want any of it, but it, it was good. I, I, well, he I, even robs his phone as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, oh well. He's in a worse situation yeah. than, than he was beforehand. So. He, he's skinned. So he's got a broken wrist. He's lost his phone. He ne- he's never going to get his daughter back. Yep. He's still giving out DVDs in, uh, <laughs> in, a, in a Blu-ray or even a digital world. Yeah. Um, even though it is a digital format, but, um, you know, and it's kind of like streaming world. Like yeah, in a streaming world, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, he's he's knackered. And I reckon once the boys, or if the boys find out before Homelander gets to them, then I would say Mesmer is in trouble, probably from both sides. To be honest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have to say, great stunt casting here, bringing in Hel- Helly Joel Osmond as this character. Um, I think that's a really good choice when you've got him standing right beside uh, Tara Reid and standing right beside Billy Zane. All three of them quite famous actors earlier on in their careers. So having him be a big player in this episode and having him turn on everybody and give them up to Homelander, it all felt even more surprising because it was him. It could have been Billy Zane, who's played the villain in loads of movies, and it could have been Tara Reid, who's also played the villain in a lot of movies. It turned out to be Haley Joel Osment, who hasn't played a villain in any movies. I think the last movie I saw him in was... was uh, Kevin Smith's Tusk. So, uh, and he's, he's the protagonist in that film. So, uh, so quite interesting to have him turn on everybody because you just don't expect it. You think all three of these are just doing interesting cameos, you know, interesting fun little yeah. moments. Um, it is, it, it turns out the reason why he was fired from, from Vault Industries is because, uh, he was doing insider trading. He, he was seen touching the hand of a guy in the finance team and learning all the information about them and doing insider training. So, uh, so that's quite interesting. That's why he was fired and that's why he was kicked out. So, uh, so yeah, probably made a really bad decision there in his yeah. career. I, I, I just love Harry Joel Osbert. Mm-hmm. I really do. And I do like this, this eighties or early nineties kid star who fell on his luck. Yeah. And stayed down there. It's not the Doogie Hauser, Neil Patrick Harris rise yeah. back to fame. It's the Haley Joel Osment who was really big as a kid and now is it taking a lot of smaller parts mm-hmm. and now just doing convention circuits. It, it was fun to see him there and the character is interesting. It's just where it leaves us that the, the, the shame of him on the roof, him not understanding what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. and there was one part that we did see where his MM goes, are you clean? And he goes, I can be. So he still uses V by the sounds of things. 
or some form. Maybe the maybe, maybe something else. Yeah, that, I think that's quite interesting. I'm not even sure whether the actual offer from MM to get him to see his daughter once a week. I'm not even sure whether that offer was truly on the table at all. Because you hear when um when Mesmer calls up the woman whose whose phone number he's been given when he calls her up it goes to voicemail so you're not even sure whether this was really the deal you know it's quite quite yeah. interesting so loads of loads of interesting plays in there uh also love the use of his powers where the first guy comes up and goes what number am i thinking of and then the woman comes up afterwards and goes what am i thinking of and he goes oh i'm thinking the same thing here's my number <laughs> it was really yeah. good really enjoyed that so that's good, good fun scenes uh my final uh moment for this the outstanding moments of the episode really just want to talk about starlight standing up for herself um because i like that they've put her on this path it's so easy to just go oh well she has been a strong independent character throughout the rest of the episode so now we'll show her the real power of madeline and madeline will be able to talk her down off the ledge and get her back into line again but they decide to go a different way i really like it you know they fired ashley uh because she's the one that made the decision to uh to have uh starlight go to the convention to believe convention everything went wrong so we've lost ashley now from from void she's she's left the company so there goes the end of our uh, our Jessica Jones reunion uh, for this for this season, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I like that she's let into even more information by Madeline. Madeline kind of thinks this is maybe the way to get Starlight back on side. Going, I wrote everything in that movie that you watched hundreds of times about Queen Maeve. I'm the one that wrote that character, and I wanted you to believe the exact things you believed about Queen Maeve. You've got to remember this character of what you are, a Starlight, was written by couple of dozen people in a room who spent hundreds of hours getting your character absolutely right you don't own it anymore um and i love that starlight still is able to stand up for herself and still takes the right path still goes no i'm, I'm not going to listen to you i want my old costume back I do, i'm not going to do reality tv shows i'm going to do exactly what i want to do and if you fire me you're going to be seen as the woman who fired the girl who just reported sexual abuse in your business and that's not going to look bad in you and it all works out well for her until the end of the episode um she'll still stand up for herself and i think that's the right way it, it needs to be seen that voice are the ones that are the bad guys you know uh, it can't be seen that she backs off she would never back off at this stage but i like that we have a little moment there where she sees that vault still has so much information on her and is still able to cut together their version of her as a superhero even without her cooperation and finally we get that moment between queen Maeve and starlight where Maeve goes i'm really sorry to her you know, um, we haven't had that since the beginning, but finally Maeve is realizing this girl is willing to stand up for what she believes in and kind of a bit of respect transferring between the two of them in that scene. Yeah. I mean, but Queen Maeve also says the house always wins. Yes. Uh, because they cobble together a, you know, they control the narrative as to the deep and what she did at Believe Expo. Um, but I, I do, I, I like the fact that, you know, in different ways, this, is reflected back onto to Queen Maeve. Mm -hmm. I love the fact, you know, this empowerment act that Queen Maeve thinks it's an act because that's what she's had to do. Yeah. Um, and that she effectively burns Queen Maeve. She goes, you know, I read your autobiography twice. You know, I had to buy another copy. Um, but um, I'm pretty sure that it was all now just written by the marketing guys. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, oh, burn. Okay. Yeah. You know, Queen Maeve, um, yeah, not quite so powerful anymore. Well, exactly. Uh, exactly. Really being brought down. And, and that's the thing when she goes, the house always wins. It's kind of like, I'm just telling you how it is here. Um, I'm not against you. Yeah. I believe in what you're doing. Uh, but it's a little bit of getting back at. Uh, Starlight as well. Oh, okay, I just thought it was being empathetic. I thought it was kind of, her, it may her, be actually. kind of going, I've been in the situation that you're in, but I'm glad you're fighting. Well done. That's um, why I'm not too sure. Yeah. I, I, because I think it should probably evolve over the next few episodes where Queen Maeve actually is the one person that can stop Homelander, that can stand up here, that even though she's lost her integrity, she can regain it with integrity uh, yeah. as well yeah. by by reversing everything that's happened because of starlight so yeah it, it could well be definitely yeah absolutely um that's it for all of our moments from the episode any notes guys yeah i have a note question i suppose um john doman the the scientist uh, looking through the window pulling silly faces at uh, the young homelander 
um, you know, the great John Doman. Is he Mr. Edgar on floor 82 that we heard in the third episode, giving all the notes and the lines? Is he, in fact, um, just a scientist who, you know, was running the test and, and got a, a connection with Homelander? Mm. Uh, or is he possibly his dad? He's not a scientist at all, but he's there kind of going, everything's all right, son, kind of thing. And that's why Homelander is happy because that's his real dad. Maybe. Um, I suspect it's not, but I, I just wondered whether, yeah, this could be, uh, one of those moments where that's Mr. Edgar. We've kind of got our first glimpse just simply because it's John Doman, you know, the great John Doman, uh, who has been in The Wire, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, in Gotham as Carmine Falcone. Yes, the wonderful Dan Falcone that we watched for years over in Gotham. Yeah, great to see him over on the show. And the minute you see him, he just stands out. I don't know, uh, to be honest. I think the other scientist is the one that's making the faces at the kids and he's just staring on. So it makes me think that he's the lead scientist possibly, uh, of this, uh, of these tests on, uh, on Homelander and potentially Homelander is the first success. That they've had. Was there anything in that extra scene, Chris, that you saw that had John Doman included in it? He he was in that extra scene. Right. Um I I think I know who they're playing him up to be. Um I it down the scientist route. Okay. Yep. Um I, I think they're gonna use him as an analogy to like the Ab- Abraham Erskine kind of Marvel uh, Cap Captain America creator of Kind of the, the superhumans, the superheroes, the super soldier serum. I think they're going to use them as that. But because not as the you guy said, writing all the talking points upstairs in Vought Industries. Yeah, no, I think he's this, the creator of Compound V. Okay. Um, great. Which is, they, they, they're, I think that's who they're going to go with. Right. Because, but it's, it'll be interesting to see. Um, so if we get him in the next episode or the others, I'll get, do a bit of a rundown on who he is. Okay. Cool. Cool. Uh, for me, my final note is we, we touched on it very briefly, which is the Seth Rogen and Black Noir film. Mm-hmm. Um, just loved that this is an interview and they, they mention how Seth always wanted to be in the Vault cinematic universe, which mm-hmm. is just a great play on the Marvel cinematic universe. Yeah. And just what they did there. And it was just, I, I loved that little, whatever, 30 seconds promo. Yeah. It was just great to see. It was, it was really good. Uh, it wasn't it just really good fun to see Seth Rogen in there. You know, you can tell that he was sitting at home kind of going, yeah, maybe I won't make a Marvel movie, but maybe I could do this. This would be much cooler. Because <laughs> this is his second show. He's done, he did Preacher as well. So, uh, so he has done a couple of comic book related shows as well. So, so kind of interesting that he's doing that. And um, just a couple of quick kind of things to keep in mind, I suppose. I'm wondering about the lie of the seven. Do any of them have a real family? Is that indication of Homelander sitting in that room with no parents around? Is that just, is that how everybody grows up? and then they were handed over to parents and handed over with a backstory. We hear A-Train doesn't have either of his parents alive anymore. It was his brother that brought him up. Um, so what happened to his actual parents? You know, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, will we find any more of that? Um, and one other line that I just really liked from Queen Maeve, just because it's what you hear from every single TV actor in the world when they're asked, what's it like working with your compatriots? You hear that from Queen Maeve. What's it like working with the Seven? And, ah, oh, we're all just the best of friends. Everything just behind the scenes. We all just <laughs> hang out with each other and, and we're great. Yet she doesn't actually talk to any of them at all ever. So I just think it's a really nice little, nice little line in there from, yeah. from her. It's like that movie promo tour where they're all going on to the talk shows and it's like, yeah, yeah we're the best of friends. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, we haven't seen each other in seven years since we actually filmed this movie. Yeah. But we're the best of friends. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, also just one final thing for me. It, it's just the line that tickled me. Uh, where Mother's Milk is effectively lying to Billy Butcher about where he is because they're at Mesmer's <laughs> house and he's, and he's saying, well, where are you? And he's like, shack burger. I've got a shack burger, cheese fries, uh, and a milkshake. And he just goes, does it taste like lies? <laughs> From Butcher. <Yeah. laughs> Great. I've got you on the track, your mate app on my phone. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> really, really good. Uh, Chris, it's time. The end of our notes. Chris, up to you for your quarter. Chris's quarter. Yes. Welcome. Boys and girls, to Chris's Corner, the podcast within a podcast where I give you the rundown on everything the boys from the comics and how it's translating. Uh, I'm going to do two quick pieces on this one part of this segment. First up is Mesmer. Um, yeah, Mesmer is a complete invention for this the TV show. Interesting. Um, I like it. <laughs> no analog whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been going through like 
other superheroes who have like the touch telepathy. There's none. Mm-hmm. There's no one with the exact kind of skill set powers in the comics. There's two telepaths in there. One is the divine who is a telepathic pimp, essentially. Um, which is really fun. Okay. Uh, and then there's Mind Droid, who's marketed as a telepathic android. Uh, but also we find out who he is telepathic, but he's not an android. Um, which is, that's as close as we get. Okay. It's a, a pimp and, uh, a guy pretending to be an android. Nice. Who can read minds. <laughs> um, so that's as close as we got. Um, what I did want to do is spend a bit of time on the female. So, uh, spoiler warning for anyone who, uh, doesn't want to, who wants to go and read the comic books after. I'm going to give the backstory to the female from the comic books. And we'll talk so, to you next week, Chris. Uh, bye. Bye. So very quickly, I'll just give the backstory of the female. So the first is, yeah, like, well, in this, we've get the, the shining light liberation army. This is all invention for the series. Um, uh, it, this, is complete departure from the comic books. But as I said, it's still kind of similar in that it's marred with this kind of family tragedy bit. So um in the comic books, her origin is that, and it's shown in about issue, it's shown in issue 38, where we start getting backstories for some of the, the boys, that her mother was a, a working mother and used to bring her baby to the office where she was a secretary. And leave her under the desk. And her mother walk, worked for Vought International. And Kimiko is never named in the comic books. There's right. no name. The female is given no name. So this is, that's also an invention. But in the comic books, she's a baby. She crawls out from under her mum's desk and war- basically crawls into a laboratory where there is a, a big vat of compound V waste. Nice. And she crawls inside it and basically drinks it <laughs> and then goes on a killing rampage, killing all the scientists who knew about the new, how to make the new version of compound V and the waste and et cetera, and gets put in a, um, cell for years and grows up as a baby to when she's found later, uh, by the boys and Frenchie, uh, where she escapes. So we, that's, that's all I'm going to give. Um, but so the inclusion of her brother, the name, all of this is just new for the TV show, mm-hmm. but it's still that family craziness because she never knew her family in the comic books. She does, she is an orphan. She basically grew up in a cell. Um, so we get some similarities. Um, but again, I'm not doing it justice. This, this origin, it's very, so well told. Uh, it's, Beautiful. Um, and again, told by Frenchie of all people as well. Excellent. Um, so I highly recommend again, when we get to the end of this season or season two, if you're interested in Chris's corner and more information, check out issue 38 of the boys. So this has been Chris's corner, the podcast within a podcast. Let us know if you want anything in particular me to deep dive on. But other than that, let's get back to the main TV podcast industry podcast. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's Chris's corner over. Let's just go quickly through uh, what did we think of this episode of The Boys. John, do you want to quickly give us what you thought about yep. this episode? Episode six, The Innocence. I really, really like this. I'd give this four and a half broken popsicles out of five. Ooh, that hurts. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. It's just all these episodes have been fantastic mm-hmm. for, for me. Um, and you're really splitting hairs about maybe why you'd give one a five and one a 4.5 or one a four. I mean, it's just really good quality stuff. I, I think what I like here is you get this sanitized version of each one of the seven. Uh, and ultimately you see the reality of it. You see Homelander struggling with these fake childhood memories. The deep is just a misogynist and, uh, you know, he doesn't practice what he preachers and um, actually a train is is dealing with all the sort of shady stuff that he's been doing yet maybe the one bit of reality in his life is being totally crossed out by vort don't talk about your childhood don't talk about the guns mm-hmm. and the kind of you know violence in the hood kind of thing it's yeah. like 
it, it's really, uh, really interesting. And then we just have, you know, this great relationship with Huey and, um, and Billy were, Billy sees himself maybe in Huey, yet Huey is moving on. Uh, and I think that's a really nice dynamic captured here. So, uh, yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, getting to see Mesmer and the big thing of Homelander finding out. Um, so yeah, it just has so much stuff, uh, in there. So absolutely loved, uh, this episode of The Boys. Chris, what did you think? I, I loved it. Um, I really did. I think everything, this show, this series just keeps going strength to strength. They are changing out from the comic books and that's actually keeping me guessing. Um, which I even more enthusiastic about because just when I think they're going to zig, they zag. Uh, just when I think I know what they're going to do and how they're going to do it, they don't. They, they completely go against what I thought. So. I'm really excited to see the next two episodes and where they go with it and where they leave Wills on the end of episode eight. Um, but yeah, so I highly, 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 highly enthused by where the season's going. But that's enough about me and my thoughts. Derek, what did you think of this episode? Great episode. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So much that went on here. I remember writing my uh, my five pages worth of notes in here and trying to pick out uh, my top three points from the episode. Was uh, I love episodes like that when there's loads and loads of stuff that you've that you've written and and seen in these episodes. So uh, so much stuff going on. Really going to enjoy the last two episodes. I don't know where it's going to land at the end, but uh, especially with this moment where you're going, oh no, the guy with the biggest superpowers in this entire universe now knows where all of our guys are. <laughs> That's yeah, exactly. so interesting. So really excited to get on to the next episode. So. I I think we should shut down this episode of the podcast but we do have some feedback over in frenchie's letters our section of the show talking about feedback Ooh la la. john you want to kick us off yeah some feedback from episode five from uh, robert phillips he says now i took a different slant on the stillwell homelander thing i very much read it as a fetish thing mm. him nuzzling into the open blouse and echoed by his x-ray peeking before what i'm now doubting is if it really is a mummy thing as suggested yeah i think i said that i thought that it might be a uh an actual mother-son relationship at the time, but it has certainly gotten creepier than that. So I don't think there is a mummy-son relationship. I, I think it's a female Homelander thing, actually. I, I think Maybe. it's more that. I think it's... He was kept in a lab, surrounded by men. Um, anytime he went close to a female, he killed them. Um, and there's something around that, for sure. Excellent. Yeah, it's just a very weird, weird fetish thing. Mm-hmm. Like really, just, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, she feels like she's kind of doing it because she knows that's what Homelander wants her to do, is kind of what it feels like, or that's her way of controlling him. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll see more as the rest of the episodes go on. Uh, Chris, do you want to take the next few feedback from Ronaldo? Sure. So, Ronaldo has this to say, for those who think Ennis can only do hardcore violent stories, you only have to look at his treatment of the deep for pure, unadulterated comedy. The deep has me in stitches, but with a slanty, a slant of pity. Mm-hmm. Oh, jeez. I only just got up to the bit of Starlight speech on stage. Please let it be known. I'm only referring to his dolphin incident with the deep, not his interaction with Starlight. Shocked emojis. Oh, shocked emoji. Shocked emoji. Shocked emoji. Yes, for those of you who are writing in feedback, please take note from Ronaldo. Don't edit it as you watch it. Uh, because you write something and then have to quickly go, oh, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> Watch the whole piece, then send us your feedback. But, Ray, I'm only messing, of course. The Deep has us all in stitches. Um, the Dolphin part was perhaps the best part of this episode. It was absolutely hilarious. Episode five, absolutely hilarious. <laughs> it got worse from there as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I do think uh, Ennis's treatment of the Deep, though, across the whole series so far has been really really good i i like the the descent to uh him going or misinterpreting stillwell's uh, instructions feeling he's kind of protected by stillwell here um and it ending off with uh dolphin sushi basically mm. can i give some some other credit though because this is all eric kripke um as the showrunner yeah. for the show uh, he actually made the point that he absolutely loves the deep in the comics he loves the joke of the deep in the comics but i think his actual line was 
but he does absolutely zero in the comic. So he wanted to give him a storyline. Okay. So Eric Kripke is, is the one actually responsible for that. So uh, so interesting that you point that out, Ray, that, uh, that, that uh, oh, Ennis is known for just his hardcore violent stories and, and The Deep is actually from, uh, from Eric Kripke. So but Ennis is only known for his, <laughs> his deeply violent storylines. Ennis is really good, genuinely really good. If you <laughs> if you like his storylines, he's uh, he did a great treatment of, of the Punisher, as we know, um, and has done some other wonderful books as well. Uh, and this is a great book, but uh, but just the deep itself is, is from Eric Kripke. He's added the heart, I think, to to the character. Well, the um, shameful heart of uh, the deep. <laughs> the blowhole of a, of a dolphin. Yeah, exactly. Deep. exactly. Uh, let's get on to some feedback for this episode. For episode six, we got a voicemail in from Steve Brown. Hey, guys, it's Steve, and this is for The Boys, episode six, The Innocence. I uh, love, love seeing Starlight standing up to Stillwell there at the beginning. And uh, that, that story she told later on about almost blinding the doctor, do you think that's true is she was she actually born a super or do you think that was just a story they told her i loved absolutely loved seeing malcolm barrett i don't know if you guys uh watch preacher but he he played a character named hoover on preacher he plays the african-american guy in the uh acds meeting who uh had had relations with ice queen um and uh uh just love this is a really good episode a lot of a lot of cool stuff in here uh for my boys moment I will say it was Billy, you know, he breaks up the meeting there, uh, but then he goes to the bench and he opens up to Huey about what happened to his wife. And I thought that was really, really great, uh, great moment for the boys there. And for my seven moment, I think it was just all the, the clips throughout the episode seeing kind of the behind the scenes look of what the PR machine kind of does to these heroes. And especially that there towards the end, seeing the whole Citizen Starlight movie uh, where Maeve tells her the house always wins. So some really good stuff in this episode. Uh, can't wait to uh, hear what you guys thought of it and then uh, to hear what you guys thought of episode seven and, and eight when we finally close out the series. Um, quick thought for Chris's Corner, and it was a real quick mention in the episode. I think you said that in the comics, uh, the female is never named, but yet in this episode mesmer uh, tells him that her name is kamiko but if you look at the cast lists on imdb it still lists her as the female so i just thought that was interesting talk to you later thanks so much for feedback steve really good to hear from you on the podcast as well uh, hopefully we hear from the next couple of episodes um really interesting to see that seth from marketing uh, is also in the preacher as well that's quite yeah cool. yeah no really interesting um i have to get back into that show mm-hmm. very soon it's on the final season i think i think uh Actually, Steve is doing on his podcast, Panels to Pixels, they're covering the final season of, of Preacher over there as well. So a good p- companion podcast if you're watching Preacher. Oh, I'll jump in and give it a look. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you, Steve, for the feedback in terms of Chris's Corner. And interesting to see that, yes, they it, over on IMDb, they just do uh, name the, the character of the female as the female. Mm-hmm. They don't give her um, anything else. Um, so they usually similar to uh, like Aaron Moriarty's character of Starlight and Annie. Yeah. They have Annie January slash Starlight. Right, yeah. Um, but they don't actually do that here. Potentially, yes, they might update it in season two because they don't want to give away the big reveal just mm-hmm. yet um, yeah. for people who are still watching or still catching up on uh, or between now and season two launches. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, good catch, good catch. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. Yeah, I too also liked uh, where Billy opens up to Huey after his tirade to the support group. Mm. Um, And I think, yes, the PR machine around all these soups uh, and the clips there are are really good, uh, leading to that really uh, fun moment with the deep as well, um, I think. Uh, Yeah, another piece of feedback on episode six. It comes from Robert Phillips. He says... Oh, this one went in very hard with the reality TV staged angle and landed it brilliantly mm-hmm. in terms of the story rather than that satirical undertones. I, I've picked my best points again, though if it's anything like the last three episodes, you'll have already covered them. <laughs> my seven moment is definitely the Homelander reveal of a non-existent child life being brought up in a laser-proof cell and more evidence of a very, very unusual fetish with Stillwell. Mm-hmm. I have to believe he will be brought down mm. or there is an attempt in this season and I still can't decide if Maeve will manage it. Mm. My boys moment 
the park bench. Not sure if Butcher's story is entirely true, but it does make lots of sense to his ongoing rage. It might ruin the story, but he could be much happier with an acceptance and compassion therapy session for a psychosocial support program. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's what he tried by going up to that support group, but he doesn't, he doesn't <laughs> like the idea of anybody whining about their lot in life. Do something about it is kind of his attitude. <laughs> exactly. My other moment is I'm loving the evolution of the female and her story. I did think the mentalist was going to be shipped in to see if Huey was falling for Starlight, but turned out even better. (laughs) Um, And Chris's corner question, does the comic thread have the deep doing his apology to camera with it being from a while ago before the most recent Me Too stuff? I'm just wondering if it didn't manage to get into the graphic novels. Uh, very quickly, yeah, no, nope, The Deep does not do an apology on camera. There is no apology to Starlight or anything like that for any of the stuff that has happened mm-hmm. in the comic books. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for your points there, uh, Bob. Uh, certainly, like you said, I do think that Billy Butcher needs some mental issues to be addressed here. <laughs> if Mesmer uh, could come and talk to him for a moment and reveal uh, what's inside his heart and what's inside his mind. Yeah, the, the, the... that might not help. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, Ronaldo says on this episode, Oh, for the love of God, I can't express how much I'm enjoying this show. Still watching in real time as I type, but had to put a few thoughts down. First, I'm loving the style of this episode intermixed with behind the scenes documentary coverage of The Seven. This is such a fresh way to tell the story. Second, the interaction between Madeline Stilwell and Annie was fantastic. The story that everything was manufactured to make it seem that Queen Maeve was rebellious is a cutting truth and a perfect way to encapsulate how heroes are built by Vought. I also love seeing seemingly infallible characters crumble and the face that Madeline strikes out of her desk after a conversation with, with Annie was glorious. Absolutely loved that moment where I really, really enjoyed seeing a little yeah. bit of a crack in the facade yeah. of somebody that thinks she's in control of all Definitely. of the suits. Suddenly we have somebody standing up, especially like Annie. I think they probably thought that she's so innocent that she'd never stand up to them. So so seeing just that proper crack in Madeline is, is glorious. Absolutely brilliant. Nice word for it as well. Ray goes on and says, I was cheering on Annie for being so brave. And it'll be interesting to see how this pans out for her. A-Train's interview was really revealing about him. All these heroes are so flawed and struggling. It's really a brilliant show. Anyway, still watching. May drop more thoughts later. Can't wait to hear your thoughts. Oh, one other thing. I also think Frenchie is my favourite character. He wears his heart in his sleeve and follows his heart. Mother's Milk is solid and relatable too, and I always love their interactions. That collateral damage group at the end, and the guy with the Ice Princess, crazy funny. And finally... Carl Urban, Billy Butcher, is fantastic in that final scene. A very good display of Butcher's inner thoughts and his ultimate motivation. A small but very effective scene. Thanks so much for your thoughts on these episodes, Ray. I know you're catching up uh, after being away for a little while from these episodes, not being able to watch them uh, when they first came out. But great to hear your thoughts on these episodes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Ronaldo, for for the thoughts. That yeah, certainly um, the the collateral damage group and the guy with the ice princess. Ice cold. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether we're going to hear from Rafe before the end of the series because I know the announcement came out this weekend that uh, that his favorite character, Moon Knight, is getting a TV show from uh, Disney Plus next year. So I think he's already in prep uh, for that show. Actually, it might be in two years' time. So I know it'll take a while to prep for it. But all systems go. Yeah, all systems go from right there. <laughs> <laughs> go, 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 go. Yes, go listen to Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. I have an appearance, I think, coming up uh, later on in September. Uh, so if you're dying to hear a bit more of my voice, you will hear me on Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast next month at some point. Yes, I, I was supposed to, but I think I've been cancelled. You have not been cancelled. Just neither of you have had the time to stay in just yet. <laughs> Chris has already been on there. You had about three and a half hours on Into the Night before, didn't you, Chris? I did. Yeah. I did. Uh, and I will probably be on before the TV show. Mm-hmm. So basically, that that will give me just prepped and ready. <laughs> for our coverage of Midnight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much for all of your feedback. Keep sending it in to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Join us over on our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. Or you can follow us over on Twitter at tvpodindustries, of course. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, don't forget, we are a fledgling podcast. We do this for the love. So if you want to reciprocate that love, don't forget to share the podcast or the drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. 
And make sure you subscribe to the podcast at tvpodcastindustries.com. We are also reviewing Pennyworth at the moment, as we've mentioned before. New episodes every Monday on Pennyworth. New episodes every Wednesday on The Boys until both of those series are finished. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back with our review of the next episode of The Boys next Wednesday. Episode 7, The Self-Preservation Society. (laughs) I think all of the boys are the members of that new society. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Can't wait to speak to you then. Yes, thank you so much, boys and girls, for joining us. A pleasure speaking with you. I'm off to Shack Burger to get some Shack Burger and cheese fries. I hope they don't taste like lies. <laughs> but once I'm fully recovered, restored, and with a full stomach, we'll be back to speak with you again soon. Bye. <laughs>